uh, University, the CLA, CLUPV, and yes, this is then Wang Zhangfa, and here's uh, here you see a picture of the torch relay during the Olympic Games. That was the guy on the on the right, this one. And then this is a caricature of the Time magazine when he was elected as Hero of the Environment. This is a screenshot taken from the CCTV uh, when he gave an interview. And yes, here you can see the screenshot of YouTube. Uh, yes, I really recommend you to watch this if you want to know more. It's half an hour long, three parts. and. Yes, there he talks about also the um, this uh, center and their their functions and their work. So here you can see a screenshot of uh, during a conference in the United States, uh, a conference organized by the Wilson Center. This is also a very important center with respect to environmental law in in the U.S. Named Greening the Courts, and there he also gave a speech. And this is um, I think the most the most um, interesting thing. There was a production called <coughs> China Rises, a four-part television series produced by the New York Times of uh, CDF, German Broadcasting uh, Corporation, um, Discovery Times and so on, about China in general. And there, in this uh, TV series, he also appeared beside another, besides another Chinese lawyer, Zhou Li Tai, which, uh, uh, who is uh, a lawyer in the field of labor law, and yes, by the way, you can also find this uh, series here in Würzburg, in the Central Library, and it's uh, called, it's an FWU film called China im Wandel, Ernährung und Umwelt. So it's in the Central UB, around three hours, when I remember right, so if you want, you can watch it. Then this is a screenshot from the web page. Here you can see this uh, number, this uh, hotline. So if you have problems, you can call this number, and they will give you. They maybe will give you legal ad or legal consultation at, at least. This is the English version of this uh, web page. And yes, I will leave out this short film. Okay. So my last point is about engaging the media because this is actually an extra legal mean, but nevertheless, um, it is an important mean to enforce uh, law. In China. So, to prove that, I want to cite Wang Zhangfa himself. He says, When a cry for help reaches us, we first send lawyers and reporters. Dirk Bietke, this uh, Sino legal, uh, this Sino environmental expert, says that there exists coalitions between the press and environmental agencies. And Elizabeth, Elizabeth Economy, once more, says that the media act as the eyes and ears of the central government in ferreting out environmental wrongdoing. So you see, the media has a quite important uh, role in Chinese law, and they work uh, with respect to environmental lawmaking. So to give you a concrete example, I want to show you this battery depositories case. There once, was, there once before was a physician named Geng Haiying, and he asked department stores for accepting used batteries, so as it is common for us here in Germany, for instance. And then <clears throat> the media got to know about this program and they started to support this program. And only a few months later, the SEPA, so this uh, ministry, issued the official regulations about such battery depositories. So you can see here the media, uh, an alliance, as Bitke calls it, between the media and the public uh, that led the government in lawmaking. So another case uh, with respect to environmental law enforcement through the media is the restaurant owner case uh, that goes as follows. There once was a restaurant owner that has been fined, that has been fined uh, due to pollution, but he refused to pay this fine. And then a local television broadcaster made a report about that case. And finally, the restaurant owner agreed to pay the fine because of the high public pressure and the loss and the lack and the loss of reputation he feared. So here you can see that the media and the public led to law enforcement. And yes, then this environmental liability 
uh, regime aspect. Uh, just I've outsourced this, and if you want, you can watch my extra video on YouTube during the next two weeks or so. So finally, to sum up my long lecture right now, I would like to uh, just shortly sum up. I just told you something about the substance issue, so what laws or if laws exist. I generally told you that the legal density is quite good and the legal quality is also good, but uh, deficiencies exist. With respect to enforcement, <coughs> I uh, can sum up that environmental law enforcement is often the main problem in practice. So this is a general opinion that you also find in the literature quite often, and that there exists several legal enforcement channels that are mediation, courts, and legal ad. There, I think there exists more, but i just shown you this. And that there exists also extra legal enforcement channels like the media. Or another issue are campaigns. This is, for instance, uh, uh, a research, inter research interest of Benjamin von Reuch. He has written about the Shuang Dabiao campaigns and the Shu Xiao campaigns. These are two main campaigns in Chinese environmental law enforcement. And yes, if you want to read them, if you want to know more about them, just read the articles of Benjamin van Roy. He's, by the way, the main leading uh, scholar with respect to environmental law enforcement in China. Another and a final and a last resort extra legal enforcement channel is, of course, violence. This is uh, actually uh, a known uh, section of literature. And I've totally left this out, of course. So, yes, for, and for environmental legal liability, just watch my extra YouTube video. And just to give future outlook about uh, the Chinese environmental situation, I personally think that uh, I personally have a more optimistic view about China's environmental future, and I've um, added here three reasons. First of all, there had been legal and non-legal environment progress in the past, and I think that this can give us also hope for the future. And a second main reason is that uh, is the aspect of growing wealth. Why? Growing wealth produces environment protection. Pro environment protection. So this has also to do with uh, Indira Gandhi's, the main leading figure during the Stockholm Conference of 1972, uh, with uh, the famous citation of her. That is, uh, poverty is the main enemy of environmental protection. And you can also see this in the case, in the Chinese case of today. So, for instance, as um, Elizabeth Economy writes, uh, some of the wealthiest cities of today's China, for instance, Shanghai or Dalian, Dalian, are environmental leaders. If they have a green political elite, a green political major, so they can, this wealth can produce environmental protection mechanisms, can lead to environmental law enforcement. And another reason, a second reason is that this theory that growing wealth produces environmental protection is that uh, most pollution today in China comes from the rural areas. So this is <coughs> also very evident because of this urbanization processes the polluting units are outsourced off the cities to the rural areas, and so this um, wealthy cities are more environmentally protected, actually. So a third reason, and this might be very simple, of course, but I think it's, it is also true with, to a certain degree that China has no other choice to improve its situation, because if not, uh, the damages done won't be repairable in the future, at least certain kinds of damages. Okay, so thank you for your attention um, to, for this long lecture. If you want to contact me, you can find me on Facebook or write me an email. If you have quest questions, criticism, contact, cooperation, or so on. So thank you once more. Okay. <laughs> can you just press the red button once more?